really fortunate to be in the presence of uh, three fantastic gentlemen who've all got things in common. And I think the best thing to do is go around the table uh, uh, as we head towards World Mental Health Day. I, I know that that's gonna be on the 10th of October. Different people will be watching this at different times. But for me, and I think for you as well, gents, every day is really a mental health day. Uh, and we've all sort of got involved in it for different reasons. Mm. So for our viewers that are watching at home, um, if we can go around, a lot of people will know you, so we'll come to you last, Dom. Um, but um, help us understand and help the viewers understand who you are and what it is. Cheers, Kev. Yeah, so I'm Nigel Seaman. I'm the uh, founder of Combat to Coffee, which is a veterans mental health project. And it's come about because of my own experiences and struggling with my mental health through something that happened whilst in service, whilst I was in the military, uh, which has been challenging. However, we talk, we, I still have struggles, but I use the power of coffee, tea, hot chocolate to make conversation. And if someone needs some help, then we'll go and get in the help because it's very challenging when you're struggling and you've got nowhere to turn. Well, I'm looking forward to finding out more about your personal story and what other people could do with coffee or other drinks, maybe, <laughs> to start some conversations. Cheers. Well, we've got uh, next to me on my right-hand side here. Yeah, I'm John Neal. I'm the Chief Executive of Suffolk Mind. We're a mental health charity that operates here in, in Suffolk. We're part of a national federation of local mind charities, so about 110 of us. We're all affiliated to the National Mind Charity, which is it's just an important distinction to make because... Uh, a lot of people will fundraise for the national one, which is fine, but they're not actually fundraising for us. And every penny that we, we raise is spent here in Suffolk on Excellent. helping people with their mental health. Good stuff. And of course, on the end here, we've got first team player, um, Dom Ball. But Dom, why is it that you're so keen to be interested in and engaged in mental health and wellbeing? I think mainly, yeah, through my, um, my own experience to start with as a young player, um, I had struggles like a, a lot of other players do. I think it's, it's you know, people are more aware of it now, but I think in the, in the environment that we're in, as a young player, I found it quite tough um, to deal with maybe the pressures, uh, moving away from home, and just the intensity of, of, of football. And I think maybe for seven, eight years now, I've realised that, that that was a gap in my, in my football that I, I wasn't working on. And... I've realized how important it is now. And for me, I still think it is the most important thing as a player. Um, and that doesn't, you know, it comes at, it comes at different stages. Um, and I think every player has, you know, struggles, has their own struggles or, you know, the, the success and dealing with that is, is really important. Of course, you're with Ipswich Town now. And we're delighted to have you. Where did that start for you? What club were you at and what age did that begin? Because I'm sure we've got young fans, we've got different generations. So when did you first start to become aware that you might be struggling, having challenges and needing help? I think it was when I was, I was probably 19 and I had a really good start to the season, but I was so intense with everything. And I, like I said to you guys earlier, I was writing lists of, of things that I had to complete before the end of the day. And I know now that is a part of my character, that intensity of, I can't sit still, I need to be doing stuff. Um, but I think we all learn as we get older, what works for us. And for me, it was, I didn't need a, you know, I didn't need a rocket to get me going. I needed someone to go, yeah. you need to calm down, you know, enjoy the small things. And I've learned that I need to deal with that more than other areas. Um, so that's what I've been, not, not fighting my whole like for, for a long time, but it's something that I've just learned. Um, I've learned. Where did you first get that help? Was it a particular coach, uh, a parent, or somebody else? It was actually, yeah, it was my coach at uh, Spurs, Tim Sherwood, had sort of said to me he knew someone. There was another lad in, a, in the team that had been working with someone and just said, Look, you know, go and meet him, see how you feel, see if it's something that you could be interested in. And when I met him, I just knew straight away this was the right person for me. Mm. I had met loads of um, performance coaches, psychologists, um, and like I've said, you, Kev, as well, it is a very personable thing, I feel, and with Jack, it was, uh, Mr. Uh, Jack Shoker is the guy that I've worked with from my whole life now, and we probably talk more now as friends and just general health and lifestyle rather than the football side of it. Um, but I'm, I'm lucky to have that. I'm lucky to, to be able to have someone like him and 
for I think it's it's more like a mentor. Yeah. Um, and I actually recently said to him, you know, I'm struggling with this. I'm 28 now. I'm married. I should be able to deal with these problems myself. I feel guilty coming to you. And he said, Dom, I'm 50 years old. I've got my own. I've got mentors as well. Yeah. And that made me realise that I don't think there's a period in your life that there's some things that we cannot you know deal with ourselves and we can try yeah. but uh, to look elsewhere and to speak to people is is so important it's a lifelong journey isn't it i mean y y some people might be surprised to know that tim sherwood and for those that know their football history would go no nonsense combative midfield player quite an aggressive coach manager yeah. who's encouraging you to go and get help for a, what some people went back in the old days might have talked about being a bit soft yeah. But it's so important. And so we go from that to military and, and the importance of conversation. And there's so much resonance in what you've just said in my journey. And my incident happened in 1994, so it was a long time ago. Can I ask? And it's okay if you don't oh, yeah, feel no, 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 I won't go into the specifics. She said, I'd get a bit nervous there straight away. But uh, it was in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Something happened in Northern Ireland, and that was a, a conflict that the military were heavily involved with at the time. Mm -hmm. I was in the local infantry med regiment, so we were deployed sort of once every 18 months. You'd go out and do a six-month tour. And it was my first tour. I was 18 years old, as I said, you're quite resilient. And I come back and I knew something had happened and I knew what had happened would probably upset me and affect me at times, but you can just crack on and you get on with it. Mm. But it, was, it wasn't until many years after that I suffered a breakdown when I had some life, I suppose life experiences all within three months. Mm. And, and what's interesting, what you just said, Dom, about being lists running around trying to get stuff boxed off i'm like that now i'm still quite early in my journey yes i've been doing a, this project four years but it was only sort of five and a half years ago i was diagnosed with ptsd so this and i'm still running around writing lists not completing my lists and john will probably vouch for that as well but the point is over this last couple of months things have started to slow down so bearing in mind this completely different military and your football yeah. The, the, the situation is still the same. Do you know what I mean? And people who know me, I'm passionate about what I do because I just don't want others to go through how low I was. And I know people do. It doesn't have to be military. It can be anyone can suffer with mental health. But mm. it just put a smile on my face of what you said there about what you do is what some of the similarities I do now. And that's just, that's just mad when the, the two situations are so different. And so we know how you two got involved. Um, what about yourself? Mm. Why did you get involved? Well, like a lot of people that get involved in, in charities and in mental health in particular, it's, um, it's either lived experience or your own personal journey, like, like Nigel's reason for setting up Combat to Coffee, or it's somebody close to you, somebody in your life. And uh, for me, uh, there was a family member who was, was struggling with their, their mental health um, a number of years ago. Uh, and once I kind of like, noticed um, that or knew more about that, I started talking to some of my, my friends as well, and some of them had their issues more um, to the, uh, bringing them more to the front when I started to talk to them about it than, than they had done before. Um, and then when I first got the job at, at Suffolk Mind, so I wanted to do, do something different. I wanted to make, make a difference. At the time, uh, before I, this job, I was working for a business. I was effectively making somebody rich. I uh, wasn't a very nice person that I was working for, and I wanted to do something that got my emotional need for meaning and purpose met, um, which is a, a phrase that means something more to me now than it did, did back then. But in retrospect, that's what I was, what I was doing. So... Mm. You know, I now have a job where I can make a difference every day. I can inspire and help other people to make a difference. And what we try to do in Suffolk is enable parents, family members, friends, mates, line managers, whoever it is, uh, to help the people around them better and to help themselves better as well. What I'd love to do is come around and get some little practical things, whether that was a personal thing that helped you or something that you've known has helped other people so mm -hmm. that those that are watching... Um, whether it's that they're experiencing something now or almost inevitable at some point in our life, whether it's through a relationship, through our work, uh, a, a loved one, uh, that when we come upon some tough times, we might, we might know what to do. Are you up for that? Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. excellent. So why do you think, not just in football, but in life, why do you think 
mental health and not just waiting for there to be a problem so I can then fix it, but being proactive. You, you are talking to a mentor on a regular basis. Why is that important for you, Dom, in, in your career and in your home life? I think it is part of a process and I still haven't, I still haven't got to a stage yet where I'm like, I've mastered my mind. I don't think I ever will. Um, but there's always new challenges and it's sort of being prepared for that. And I, I've actually, I'd say recently, I, um, I was shocked that I wasn't feeling, I wasn't feeling great. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was. I kept saying, I kept saying to my wife, my family, like, I just don't get it. I'm waking up in the mornings. I see myself as, you know, people to, people's perception of me, I would always want it to be, he's positive. And people would still say that, but I knew inside, I'm not feeling positive. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, I'm not feeling positive. And I have spoken, so I would speak to my mentor um, and I kept saying to him, something that stood out for him, which I kept saying was, life's better for me when I'm playing. Mm -hmm. And I've said that throughout my whole career. So this is another challenge. I've got over it before, but this time I couldn't get over it. I'm like, this is my job. I'm not doing my job regularly. There's something missing inside of me here. And I wake up every morning and it's, it's not how I want to wake up. Yeah. And he goes, Tom, how are you going to feel after your career when, if your life's only, your life's only good when you're playing, and that, that is basically defining you. And it was, it was crazy how quickly we've sort of changed my sort of mantra to life's better when I'm fighting. I'm, I would see myself as a bit of a fighter, fighting for my happiness, fighting for, um, fighting for my place in, uh, on the team. And it's crazy how something like that waking up in the morning, it doesn't matter if I play, I'm still, I'm doing everything I possibly can to get in that team. That's out of my control. Well, for me, fighting is in my control, mm. but you know, other players playing and doing incredibly well, the manager picking team, that's out of my control. I can't control that. And that was just an example, I think recently of, I'm in such a better place now, just with that little switch. And that's getting it from someone who's got experience, who's just looked at it and gone, it's pretty simple, Dom, like. Yeah. So speaking, speaking to people and seeing it from a different point of view really helps. So it sounds to me, if I bounce this back at you, one, you get a mood benefit, yep. feeling more positive. Yep. Um, but two, you've got a performance benefit because you're also playing better from yep. being proactively engaged in working on your mental health and your, mm -hmm. and your well-being. Yep. Yeah, definitely. How has it benefited you? I know you're saying it's relatively early for you. Um, four or five years in. For me, doing what I do has helped me grow emotionally. Mm. I do sometimes, I do go have backward steps. Some, some days are backward steps, but I always go forward the next day if I can, mm. because I have put stuff within my toolkit that I can know that I can't sometimes change what happened yesterday, but I can influence tomorrow. Mm. And I can, if I can accept yesterday maybe wasn't as good day as I liked, but I know tomorrow I'm going to make it a better day. That's part of that journey, so, if that makes sense. So acceptance and patience. Yeah, yeah. and it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that it's done, it's complete, it's final. You can still still have uh, uh, thoughts, feelings, and emotions about it, which may not be happy. But actually, I don't want that to be my my specific incident. Don't want me to be the controller of my life. Mm. And if, if an example had a wobble over tea bags last week at work, and, and is, I laugh about it now, but at the time I couldn't process the information. Something had happened. I go into complete meltdown, and then someone says something to me, not intentionally, which then is a trigger to me from my situation, and it is a real meltdown. And it's just someone at work understands me one of the, one of the staff and and then happens the person who sort of runs me she's a trained psychologist which does help because she knows how to bite size information and she just changed my thought process for a split second and i then realized hang on it's tea bags right just take a minute and then look at it again. And I literally just, it wasn't, it's a bit of mindfulness, but just for 30 seconds. So I'm a bit of a push and a reset button. And then, right, I can't believe it. And I do apologize. And people say, you ain't got to apologize. The team, because the team know when I have a wobble, but it's, it's, it's understanding. And when you're in that, when you're in that hypervigilant situation, 
which you can be probably anywhere in life, football, in a job, anything. If something happens and you get a bit anxious and things go off the scale, it's bringing that control mechanism just for that split second to remember where you are and what the situation is. Now we kept the tea bags and we're selling them, so it's all right. But the, the, the point of it at the time, I couldn't process the information, that my, my mind wasn't working fast enough. So what I'm hearing you say is, is that the benefit it's given you is self-acceptance, self-understanding, yep. intellectual, emotional intelligence development. Yep. Um, and, and it sounds like you've been a little bit kinder to yourself. Than Probably am, I'm giving myself some time. Yeah, good. Now, John, through Suffolk Mind, you'll see benefits to yourself, but to yeah. lots of people that you get to serve and contribute to. So yeah. uh, what are some of those benefits that you've seen that help people avoid or get more of because mm. they've been involved in, in this kind of work? Well, quite often some of the, the biggest or most interesting benefits we see are for in, in the prevention world rather than treating people who are unwell. We do lots mm. of that as well, of course, but if we're going to really make a difference in the long term, uh, and our mission is to make Suffolk the best place in the world for talking about and taking care of mental health, and if we're going to do that, that means preventing mental ill health. And to do that, that means helping people or equipping people with the tools to look after their mental health and that of the people around them. Um, and the situation Don was just describing, so we do that through a, a particular approach called emotional needs and resources. Um, so to avoid stress, we have emotional needs that must be met. And stress is your body's way of telling you that one or more of those needs is not being met. Um, Dom isn't in control of, of who, who plays for Ipswich Town uh, on at any given moment, so his need for control over that is not, not being met. Um, and what Dom just described is rather than kind of focusing on that control and, and uh, almost obsessing with it, it's kind of letting go of that. Okay, I can't control that. What can I control? And what's within Dom's control is how hard he works, whether he goes out on a lash, where, um, what he eats and drinks whether he has a herbal tea or, or one of Nigel's coffees. There's lots of things that you can, which are, would be perfectly good for his uh, footballing abilities, of course. Um, there's lots of things that you can control. And by focusing on those and letting go of the things, that can help you to let go of the stuff that you can't control, ultimately. Um, as you know, Dom's uh, book goes through lots of these different things as well. He, he didn't know it when he was writing it at the time, but I've read Dom's book and I've written loads of notes in it. I've graffitied all over it where there are instances or, or, or um, anecdotes that he portrays that, that demonstrate that different needs are not being met at different times. And uh, it's the same for everybody. It's a real level up. Um, doesn't matter whether you're a professional footballer. I mean, recently we've had Richarlison, who's uh, Brazilian number nine, uh, plays for Tottenham, been talking about his problems outside of football um, and been really open about it, which is which is great. And a lot of people will be thinking, what problems has he got? He earns millions. Um, and that's imposter syndrome uh, in, in many ways. But it doesn't matter who you are. You've got the same brain, ultimately. We're all wired slightly differently. Uh, but we have the same brain, we have the same emotional needs that must be met and we can all experience stress. And at that point, when we're experiencing stress, like Nigel just, just, just described, we're reacting to stuff instead of responding to stuff. And so we're trying to just help people to understand it. Okay, spot the signs of stress within yourself. Hopefully before you, you get to the point where you really have a real wobble, um, but you know earlier than that, and uh, try and identify what need is not being met. What, what do I need to change in my life? What could I change that can help me to deal with that stress and to, to think more calmly and clearly. So it sounds like what we're saying is, is there's really a transition going on. Uh, it feels to me like um, 10 years ago, we were struggling to get people to talk. And there was a campaign, whether it was the Royal Family, whether it was the FA and the PFA in football and, and all kinds of other organisations like Suffolk Mind getting wanted people to talk. And it feels like we're almost like, like on the cusp of the next evolution of that of moving beyond talk and actually developing routines or habits, techniques and strategies that enable us to be more capable or more skillful with our mental health, as opposed to waiting for ill health to happen, that we can actually stay on the front foot and, and actually be positive and proactive. So what I'd love to do is find out for all your different circumstances, as like one or two, maybe even three or four top tips of what's worked for you, and, and then maybe people at home can go and experiment with it and see if those top tips will work for them as well. Up for that? Yes, yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, Dom, I think you've talked about having a mentor, someone that you could talk to on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be somebody that's an expert, that's qualified, that can just be a caring friend, yeah. right? And go and have a coffee with them. But what else has really worked for you with being proactive on building your mental health muscle? 
I think like you said there, the most important thing is I'm very lucky to have a supportive family um, that I've had, you know, mum and dad are very, very wise. They've been through different experiences, but still it's my mum and dad. Um, I've got my brothers and I've got a good, uh, good group of friends. I found that having a mentor, which was sort of outside of all of this, I was able to be as honest and open as I possibly could say things to him that I was thinking, oh, you're going to judge me here. Yeah. Like, how could I be feeling that way? Yeah. Um, so I'm very, I think even just speaking to your friends, I, my, my group of friends, you know, we're, we're a group of lads, we're 28 years old. We love to have a laugh, you know, WhatsApp. You can imagine our WhatsApp group is taking the mick a lot, but we're all actually aware of each other's situations. And we're quite good at saying, no, I'm not, I've, I've had a bad day. Um, whether that's a FaceTime or a call. Um, and I think we're past the stage of, that's not cool. Like it's, it's we're past that stage of, yeah. we're actually, you know, we're growing up now. We're, everyone, we're a caring group. We want people to be happy. Um, and even when we see it outside of our group, we want people to be happy. We would be, you know, we'd want to offer that, offer that help to people. Um, so I think that's definitely changing and people are becoming more aware of that. Um, but in terms of me, I think I've gone through a process of loads of different things. You know, we talk about visualization, yeah. um, meditation. I actually, just because of the character I am, when I was doing, when I was meditating regularly, it got to a stage where it just got too intense. Yeah. So I, I started with a five minute visualization, bit of breathing, and it ended up getting, I was sitting there on a seat for an hour and my girlfriend's lying in bed. Um, she's going, Dom, you've been sitting there for an hour. What are you doing in your own head? Like, I was like, and that's when I was, all right, okay, I need to, I need to calm it down a bit now. Um, but I think more recently it was how I approached the day from lying in bed for five minutes thinking, I think that's been probably throughout my life, my, my hardest thing is overthinking. Um, not into boredom, I've never been really that bored, um, but just the processes of my, of my thinking that eventually will turn to a negative thought and then that can spiral, spiral out of control. It's being able to identify that, being aware that that can happen and having techniques to go, okay, I, I know a way that I can change my mindset. Starting in the morning, yeah. um, just little things like I enjoy my coffee in the morning, I get up as soon as that alarm, alarm, um, <laughs> alarm clock goes off, it is that little battle of, no, you're straight up, you're straight up and that's the first win of the day. Um, a bit of breathing and then me and for example at the moment I've been doing stretching in the morning N nothing too intense but it's just something that me and my wife do for, for 10 minutes um, down the stairs and I feel like that has just started my day in a positive I've done something positive in the morning um, and then I go into training in a lot better mood <laughs> yeah you've nailed a number of evidence-based techniques um, elevating your mental health within your values hierarchy for a lot of young men, it's about success. There's somebody once said to me, success without happiness, that's really failure. Yeah. So for you to elevate enjoying the journey alongside the striving, that's really important. You talked about having routines of knowing what brings you happiness, whether it's an organizer's coffee in the morning, mm -hmm. right? You talked about mindfulness or meditation, but catching yourself getting obsessive about things. Yeah. One of the techniques that I really liked that you talked about was, was labeling. There's some research that says, if I can accurately label how I'm feeling, if it's yeah. a negative emotion, if I, I, I can say it out loud that I'm feeling angry and somebody hears it, it actually reduces the feeling. Yeah. Or I'm feeling stressed, or I'm feeling anxious. So some brilliant insights there. Yeah. What would you go for, Nigel? What's well, your you, practical you, bits? You, the, the, be kind to yourself. Mm. I think that's the massive thing. I think because I come from a military background, and we work with and we help anyone, and very privileged to work with John and partner with Suffolk Mind, and I, I mean that genuinely because John wants Suffolk to be the best place, and I live in Suffolk, so I want it to be the best place. Do you know what I mean? For, I suppose, my needs. So being kind to myself is important. The military do a great job in training any one of our forces to go to combat. It doesn't matter if you're RAF, Navy, uh, Army, whatever role you do, you're all, your first six, seven weeks of training is literally, they take you to the lowest point in your life, then they build you up when they teach you a buddy-buddy system. You're there for your mate, you're there for your comrades, you're there for your country. Country. you can have things happen to you but you keep going you keep going and I think 
when you struggle with military mental health, you keep going because that the military never untrains you. They don't they don't unprogram you when you leave. You lose your identity a little bit. You give your ID card in and you walk and then you're a civilian. And actually after 12 and a half years, I'm like, what do I do now? Yeah. And then that was quite, and I was 30 at the time. And that was quite, hmm. And that was looking back and reflecting. That was a real dip in my mental health coming into Civvy Street because my incident had happened 10 years before, but I didn't know how to deal with it. And I've, as I've grown, not being critical of myself, and I think anyone who struggles will be critical of themselves. You just give yourself a couple of minutes to say, do you know what? I ain't a bad person. This hasn't been anything that I've done. This is something that's happened in my journey. And actually, you will get better in some respect. And I think that's the, the, the key to all of it. Mm. And, and, and I'm a lot better now than I was. And I probably still have a way to go, I feel. And, but I'm certainly better than I was yesterday. And I'm certainly better than I was with the tea bags. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and, and that's the important thing. And, and it's just, just giving yourself some time, giving yourself something back. One of the little things I give to our academy players, our scholars or under 18s or 21s, is, is teaching them to be able to say thank you and well done to themselves. Yeah to yeah. say thank you to my brain for getting me through that game, to say thank you for my body for healing itself, yeah. to say well done for that step up from being young to now being full time, or well done for you know yeah. going outside my comfort zone and pushing myself in training or whatever it may be, and, and being kind to myself. And, that, and that's it, and I'm, I've just uh, volunteered to do some work for the foundation. I used to teach PE in prisons, mm -hmm. and I wanna be kind to myself and give something back, and even if it's a couple of days a month, doing something different in a football club for nothing, because I want to do it for nothing, and supporting a young kid or someone who may be at disadvantage and is learning something through the club. Why wouldn't I do that? But that's giving something back to me. I'm choosing to do that. And I'm quite excited about that because that will take my mind off other things because it's part of that new journey. So I want to get from you all uh, any campaigns, any things that you're involved in. But first, John, I haven't got your top tips, little yeah. practical things that have worked for you or you've seen work for people that your, your fantastic charities helped? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick, we've got tons on our website um, which people can look at, but I'll pick three in particular. So one, uh, leading on from what Nigel's just said there, is volunteering. Um, we've got, there's evidence, we've got evidence, we've gathered the evidence from a, an emotional needs audit across Suffolk that people who volunteer, particularly men who volunteer, are much more likely to be uh, meeting their emotional needs and avoiding stress and avoiding mental ill health. Uh, so that's number one. The second one is focus on your sleep. Um, sleep is incredibly important from a physical and a mental health point of view. Um, again, there's loads of evidence around uh, dementia and around borderline personality disorder and around suicidal ideation as well that's linked to the quality and the length of your, of your sleep. Um, it's often the first thing to go wrong when someone's experiencing a, a period of mental ill health. Um, but it's also one of the most straightforward things to fix. I wouldn't say it's easy to fix, but it is straightforward. So unfortunately, having less coffee would be one of the things. <laughs> um, but also having a routine. I mean, having a routine, go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time, prioritise the bedroom to make it a place, a shrine to, sweet, to sleep almost. So only sleep in your bed. Don't do other things. I don't mean naughty stuff. I mean, don't read Dom's book in bed. Read Dom's book in a, in a chair next to your bed. And then you pattern match being in bed with being, being asleep. And the third one, which is linked to that, is... Uh, put your attention harvesting device down more often. So you might call it a mobile phone, um, but it's an attention harvesting device. It, it harvests your attention, sells it to someone else who wants to sell you something that you don't really want um, or make you vote a certain way or make you outraged about something. Um, and particularly, again, when you go to bed, leave it downstairs. Don't take it to bed with you because it doesn't help you to get to sleep. It doesn't help your brain to, to turn off and, and to process the day. Uh, if you're sitting there playing Clash of Clans on your on your phone or whatever it is, <laughs> doom scrolling on Twitter or, or whatever. Brilliant. Love it. For my little top tip, if I can throw one in, Dom took to learn about having a mentor. Mm -hmm. And not everyone can perhaps uh, afford one or uh, maybe live in a rural area or find it difficult to get to one. So what I found as a young kid growing up up north in Doncaster was I got my mentorship through books. And uh, more recently, since then, I'm going to show how old I am now, uh, we've got the internet and, and we've got podcasts and we've got YouTube. So if I can't go and get myself a real 
mentor, mm -hmm. whether it's somebody that's volunteering through a charity or I can't get into a, a community hub, that maybe I can get online and start looking for strategies and te techniques and mental health strategies online and then just do like my own little experiment with them. I might pick one per week or one per month. I'll prioritize my sleep this month. I'll try meditation next month. And, and even if I only do one a quarter, by the end of the year, I've got four new mental health techniques that maybe even take one off of each of us. And by the end of the year, I've got a, a bigger mental health muscle than I might have done at the start of the year. So that, that's probably the one that I would go for. Mm. So um, as we sort of get towards the end here, you're all engaged in very different ways in certain campaigns and wanting to reach out to the community um, and help and make a difference. So if people are feeling inspired, they want to get involved, um, what are the different ways that we can, we can do that? We'll start here with you, Nigel. So uh, I'll mention then, John can continue. We're doing a campaign with the club, Suffolk Mind and Combat to Coffee, called I've Been Better. The bean is as in coffee bean. Nice one. Uh, and, uh, and I think we can all be honest and say that everyone has been better sometime in their life. And this all came about as a, I was involved in a, a situation in a supermarket in town. I had a bit of a wobble over a bag for flowers. Mm. And the staff didn't quite understand what, because I couldn't articulate myself properly. And I had a complete meltdown, burst out crying and they just see me as being a bit of a pain in the backside. However, it was a, a bit of a mental health back breakdown and that made me realize what can I do to make people realize without labeling yourself that we may struggle. Mm -hmm. So me and John had a chat and, and, and I said, I've got this idea of having a, a coffee bean as a symbol, but it means that I've been better. So we've come up with a, a, a badge with the uh, foundation and with Suffolk Mind which could roll out across the whole county and even across the country. And it is literally that we can all say in our lives, if you're wearing that badge or it's a car sticker or whatever, that we've been better and we understand that you may have been better too. And I think I'm quite excited to be working with Suffolk Mind and John on this. And I think if we get it right, it's gonna help not only the county, but it's gonna help people at the club who come and visit on a match day, mm. who don't come and visit actually in, just made because they struggle, but that can identify. There's a not 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 labels said, but it's it's quite exciting. And and yeah, let John finish off. John, where can people and how can people get involved? Um, well, we haven't launched it yet. We're launching it uh, as part of this this video and our, our match day takeover on the seventh of October, and 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 after that. At that point, we'll be able to. I think we'll be going to be selling them on the Suffolk Mine website in the Ipswich Town. Uh, the Planet Blue shops and in Combat to Coffee outlets as yep, well. That's it. Um, so look out on social medias for when where, where that's going to be available. But what what I like about it is such a, a, a kind of beautiful, simple idea that you you put this badge on, and that that just signals to everybody that um, some days you've been better, but also if someone else has been better, they can talk to you and and they can approach you. And obviously, as, as um, symbolising Nigel's uh, business, let's just go for a cup of coffee or let's go for a cup of tea. Yeah. Or, um, go for a, a chat and uh, because today I've been better or today you've been better um, and it's just a, a really good way of, of encouraging people to be a bit more open about their mental health but to talk to other people as well um, and to signal to others that they're open to talk to them Brilliant. and help them. And for those of us that are able to, um, to be generous in whatever that way that may be uh, in contributing uh, to Suffolk Mind Oh yes, uh, we're always that, up for that. Knowing that, <laughs> yeah. knowing that those resources come right back into our county. Is yes. there anything else that you want to encourage people to do uh, before we wrap up today? Yeah, my, my final tip would be to buy Dom's book, funnily enough. And he's not, uh, I mean, he's been uh, uh, generous enough to sign my copy, which I bought ages ago uh, and read a while ago. And as a parent of two, uh, two young girls, one of whom plays football now on a Friday night as well for Kestrove Kestrels, get a plug for them in. Um, she, it's, uh, this is, any parent should, should read this book, whether, whether you have got children who play like football or not, there's a lot that you can take from this, from being a parent in terms of how you encourage your, your children, but also the, just the environment that you uh, create for them, the support that you give to them, the relationship that you have with them, being there for them no matter what. Um, there are lots of instances that Don, Don talks about in here, because um, it's not just about him, it's about him and, and um, five of his mates as well, mm. each of whom had uh, started out playing football when they were really young, loved it, 
um, and then went through different paths uh, in terms of their footballing and other careers, which is really interesting. And from a mental health point of view, from a like, mental health rather than mental ill health point of view, um, I think that it's full of great messages and great tips that you'll just absorb rather than uh, necessarily write down as a result of reading it. Thank it's you. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Commission checked Morris. in the post. <laughs> yes, uh, I was. I was going to say the same thing. I think it was. It was more powerful for me to use um, to show it as a group of my friends who are still my closest friends now, and just I think you know you, you mentioned it there. It looks at how all, all six of us went through different things. For example, we talk about loneliness and how that affects your mental health, boredom. Um, for me, overthinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and dealing with change, actually, a, a, a lot of there's a lot of in there about the different lads dealing with change. These are all things that people go through, and that's not just in football. I was able to sort of put that out there through my book and football and my journey. Um, but I think it's, and even now, my group of friends are going through different stuff. But it's having access to to actually moving forward, to progressing, to actually you know learning from it that. It's probably my biggest concern for people is, is how are they getting that? Um, I think, you know, you, you can say it's very old school of people saying, you know, you know, we're tough, we get on with it. Uh, for me, that doesn't, I, I don't think that, that helps. And there are cases where look, we can get on with it. Um, but having people that you can talk to being open, and I think that's the thing that I like to say is that people, could, you can trust, trust the people that you know that they're, that they're there, that they are there for you. And I think, Doing that, you, you you might have to be a bit vulnerable. Um, I think we've all spoke about stuff here today, which you know these might be things that we've struggled with, and that is being vulnerable. And I know everyone's different, different characters. Some people are more close. Some people, I would, I'm very open. Um, but everyone, there can be processes for each individual that can help them with just life in general. Um, I think obviously. In my book, there are different aspects of that, which for parents, even for young people, can you know people can tap into that. So mm. beyond the book, Dom, that principle of a problem shared is a problem halved. Yeah. Um, and my understanding is is that you've been up to Downing Street recently. And is there anything from that that you might want to encourage people to know about or get involved with? Well, I went to. I was very uh, very privileged to be invited to Downing Street on on Monday. Um, that was for Sarcoma UK uh, with Jeremy Hunt. His his brother passed away last month um, with sarcoma, which is obviously a rare form of cancer. And although my book does focus on football and the mental health problems that you know young players and young people go through, all the funds raised are, um, are for Sarcoma UK. And I mean, the book's done. It's done far better than I thought it would do, and I've been. I'm really. I'm really proud of it. And. I think it's brilliant, you know, getting feedback from yourself and people that have read it um, of the lessons that I learned in there um, in regarding mental health. So there is a link between, you know, mental health and, uh, and Sarcoma UK through my book. And I really appreciate, if, you know, all the feedback and people buying the book and, you know, long may that continue. Well, big thanks to you all giving so generously of your time, not just today, but all the other things that you've done before this and that you'll continue to do over the coming weeks, months and years. I think it's stating the obvious that there's something pretty special happening at Ipswich Town Football Club at the moment. Um, And a lot of people see that as winning results on a football pitch. Um, As somebody that feels privileged to be on the inside of that, uh, we work really hard proactively to help our people have positive mental health. Uh, You see us coming back from behind, losing by a goal, losing by two goals, but it's because over the last two and a half years, We've been training for resilience. We've been training for other character traits that form a key part of mental health. And it's that that's helping us win on the pitch as well as off it as well. If there's one thing that this football club cares about more than winning, it's our people. And it's, and it's the people in the wider community of our fan base that goes beyond Ipswich, beyond Suffolk, and, and that's around the world. So big thanks for everything that you do, all of you. Thank you for your time, and hopefully people watching at home have uh, found this useful. Thank you for the opportunity. Cheers, thank you, thank you.